Would you fall victim to murderous children? What if they snip-snapped you all over your body with their fleshy little toddler beaks? What then? You are never going to believe where this story takes us. We open on the ultimate alpha daddy, Dr. Hal Raglan, working to help psychoanalyze the best way for Michael to sack up. It probably would have been better for you had you been born a girl. And while he finds some success, things do get strange. I could look you in the eye if, if I wanted to, Daddy. I, I, just, I just don't want to look you in the eye. But at least they have doctor patient privilege. Oh, hey, well, learning can be fun. Michelle is pressed to get all up in his feelings of anger and hatred, which are physically manifested in the presence of boils all over his body. With encouragement, he soon finds himself diving all the way in and through, hoping to emerge on the other side to healing and absolution. But that, my friends, is for another day. And with that, the spectators are thanked and welcome to leave. Except for Frank Carvith. He's here on official business involving his young daughter Candace, picking her up from a visit with her mommy. But they barely have a moment at home with Mr. Bubble before finding evidence of abuse. So when Raglan finishes with his office shower and is informed that Frank doesn't seem like he's going to leave on his own, Hal agrees to meet with him about his concerns. He wants to have a word with his wife Nola to get to the bottom of this, but she's under a strict and intense treatment regimen that does not include conjugal visits. When Dr. Raglan casts stout on the likelihood of his accusations, Frank does admit that Candace is unwilling to talk about the details, so he doesn't actually know anything, but he's pretty sure that somebody did it. They reach a stalemate when Frank threatens to withdraw Candace from the treatment plan, which would have a negative impact on Nola's recovery. With much of the success of his psychoplasmics method riding on this, and the impending premiere of their new infomercial, Raglan confirms his willingness to go to court on behalf of Nola for any custody issues. With that wrinkle now forming, Raglan initiates phase two of treatment. After supper, Frank almost immediately goes for a consultation with his attorney. The recommendation is to tread lightly. Raglan is an actual medical doctor, which lends credibility to his kooky treatments. If it looks like they're denying a young girl access to her mother, this could raise some issues regarding his custody rights. But what if Frank were to dig up some dirt on raggedy old Raglan? To call his credentials into question? This is a possible option, but if he wants to avoid a writ, as we all typically do, he'll have to do it fast or allow visitation. Frank hits the main streets of the local public school, but not for investigating. It's to answer for his absence at the last open house in light of Candy's poor academic performance. They then go for a visit with Mama, who adores both her granddaughter and a tumbler of fine scotch. She laments the parental burden of being blamed for the shortcomings of the child, sometimes derived from the memory of things that may not have even happened. And how do you contend with that? Frank encourages her to center these visits more around Paw Patrol than the vast wasteland of existential dread wrought by the tremendous human capacity to remember and stew slowly in the tepid swamp of our own personal histories. Anyway, before getting to that, she has to go top off. Meanwhile, Nola is receiving a therapy in which Raglan is playing the part of Candy, trying to see if he can suss out the cause of her abuse. But Nola insists that mommies don't ever harm their children, not unless they're bad mommies like hers. Her mommy was fucked up and bad. So he quickly switches personas and becomes Nola's mother, now insisting, as Nola had, that mommies never hurt their children. But Nola has clear memories of being tossed down the stairs as a child. Seeing an opportunity for healing, Raglan dares her to dive into this wellspring of anger and show him. Shown of, at Mother's house, they're perusing the pictures of young Nola in the hospital. Juliana insists she would wake up with strange injuries that the doctors couldn't identify. Meanwhile, the milkman becomes very insistent that they receive his bounty. Oh my god, it's getting under the trim! You're never going to be able to clean that! Juliana is very casual about all this banging, as she frequently gets rodents and neighborhood cats invading her kitchen when it's time to collect the winter bounty. But when she enters the kitchen, the rodent is wearing a snowsuit, and it bashes her about the face and head with a meat tenderizer. Candace comes to check on why her high C has taken so long and finds herself to be strangely ambivalent to the whole affair, and luckily spared from bodily insults. Frank just barely arrives on the job site when he gets a call from dispatch. It's the police calling him in about the recent murder. They wanted to ask him if his mother-in-law had any enemies and how many people Candy has killed just to see if they can catch him while the psychologist finishes questioning her. When he arrives, the prognosis is that she has some sort of psychic trauma that's causing partial memory loss. 
This indicates that she witnessed the event, and if they don't help her remember and come to terms with it, she could experience a potential mental or physical breakdown. So after he gets her home, he tries to leverage story time to see if she might tell him a tale about blood and anguish, but she keeps her lips sealed. Plus, he's called away by the phone but doesn't reach it in time. This was an unauthorized call from Nola. She had some sort of deep sense that something was wrong. While in a hypnotic state, she delves into her fears and insecurities around having her child taken from her as Raglan slips comfortably into the role of her father. He suggests Frank is being protective of their daughter, as daddies should be, to try to draw out some details about her own childhood. She rejects his assertion because he was a passive daddy. Although, despite feeling that he didn't do enough to protect her from her mother, her love for him never wanes. Later, we find Frank and Candy at the airport to pick up Juliana's estranged husband, Barton, who has arrived for the funeral. He's feeling a bit nostalgic about seeing the old house where he used to make love to his wife. Sometime after, in service of his investigation, Frank visits a boarding home to hook up with Jan Hartog. When he arrives, he finds the door open and your boy working on his fitness with some strenuous log rolls. Once he's good and moist, he welcomes his visitor in with a diatribe about the body's second heart, the lymphatic system, which he has a whole theory about because really, it's just so important. Their attorneys are buddies and got them connected because Jan's working on building a case against Raglan as well. But for him, the complaint is centered around physiological trauma. See, it's a nasty form of cancer. And it's spreading. He holds the belief that Raglan's special treatment encouraged his filthy body to revolt against him. This is, of course, incredibly hard to prove, but if they can get to court and associate psychoplasmics with cancer, they have a chance of ruining the business. As such, he is very enthusiastic about helping Frank, but Frank has just about hit his daily limit of being in Jan's company. Speaking of PP, Barton's been loitering and drinking for some time now, waiting for his chance to confront Raglan about speaking with his daughter. He's looking to share the bad news about the funeral and in his old school world, this sort of thing takes precedence over everything else. But her new school therapy requires seclusion and this could upset the delicate process. Barton insists that if he doesn't hear from Nola that evening, he's coming to get her tomorrow. Then he races home in reverse. When we catch up with Frank again, he's super late for picking up candy from school, meaning he owes Miss Mayer and he always pays his debts timely. So he offers her an invite to a dinner conference combo meeting. But alarmingly, rather than schoolwork, the conversation revolves around Candace's need for a mother in her life. This opens the door for Frank to unload on her about his complicated relationship, and Ruth is thankfully saved from this by a call from Barton. The place has taken a hold on him now, and he's been depressed and drinking all day. He's resolved to go back to the facility that very evening to raise a ruckus, and wants Frank and his two fists to tag along for backup. Since he's going with or without him, Frank commits to coming to get him under the assumption that, as a teacher, Ruth will be naturally inclined to continue caring for and nurturing children well into the twilight hours. While Barton waits, he fixes things up like when he lived there, back when the chalk outline was still fresh and new, and he weeps. He travels with his sadness up the stairs and stumbles into the bedroom. He braces himself and lets it all out. Atta boy. But from below, a small figure emerges, grabs a couple of glass orbs, pauses briefly so he can soak in the hell that is its face, and then unleashes hell upon his face. This is right as Frank arrives at the house. He enters the sounds of a struggle and runs up to find Barton's grill has already been turned into hamburger. He averts his eyes, barely noticing in time that there's a beast in the corner and it has a damn arm. Frank still fancies himself a spry bitch, so he pursues the assailant who does end up getting the drop on him, but only for a quick hello before it shrivels up and dies on the bathroom floor. At the department, the detective is dumbfounded that the thing was in the house the entire time. The problem was that they weren't looking for a minuscule murderer. Then, since every officer is allowed to invite one guest to an autopsy, Frank is welcomed in to learn firsthand about this creature. It suffers from distorted vision, has no genitals, has beak-like gums instead of teeth, and it was receiving nutrients from a fleshy sack on its back that allows it to go hard until it's depleted. Oh, one more thing, no navel, which means it was never born. By mammalian means, of course. Meanwhile, Ruth receives a call at Frank's house from Frank's legal wife, and she gets a little 
taste of the instability he's been experiencing. This gives Nola a new focus for her treatment. Even though it could not be the cause of her problems since she just found out about it, she is sure that her family has been ruined by this harlot teaching her man about infidelity. Again, Ruth is a blank slate, but that doesn't stop Raglan from taking on her persona, assuming her intentions and going in hard on Nola. When Frank finally arrives home, Ruth recognizes that the best option for her is to back away slowly from his complicated life. When he goes to check on Candy, she's awake and upset by a dream she saw. He wants to help her process this, but the dream doesn't want her to tell. Instead, he tries to reassure her that the thing she saw hurt her grandma is dead, describing the autopsy in graphic detail to provide some finality for her. When the news reaches the Soma Free facility, Dr. Raglan orders the main house cleared of all patients. Consequences for their recovery be damned. He then takes a few moments to stroke his trusty handgun, while his assistant undertakes the hard work of convincing Michael to leave daddy. Later, Frank circles back with Jan, who has some fresh evidence for him in the form of young Michael here. He's barely holding it together and very upset that Nola takes all of his daddy's professional time and attention now. He believes that her recovery would demonstrate psychoplasmics as the ultimate therapy. But as a second order of business, he'll be my daddy. He won't do it anymore. And my real daddy won't do it. He has an opening to fill. The only qualification is willingness. He's down so bad with his addiction to Raglan that he'll tell Frank whatever he wants to hear, eventually blurting out that everyone was thrown out purely so Raglan could have some quiet time with Frank's wife. Speaking of which, Hal happens to be outside her therapy cabin as they speak, doing a check to make sure everything is ship shape. And it is not, which confirms his worst fears. The next day, Frank drops Candace off at school amidst a horde of snow suited little freaks. As Miss Mayor prepares for circle time, a couple of unregistered students arrive. They carefully tuck Candace away for later so they can get down to business, acquiring the tools of their trade and then plying them vigorously against the poor teacher, and in full view of their classmates who do nothing to help. Frank was still outside having a chit chat, so when a bloody child runs into the courtyard, he rushes to the classroom. Unfortunately, he arrives too late to save her, and then he unknowingly ruins all art projects for the rest of their lives. He then runs out hoping to find his daughter. Candy! Candy! But no one can tell if he's asking or offering. At the cabin, Raglan wakes Nola up from a wonderful dream in which her family was returned to her and Miss Mayer was brutally savage. She feels light as a feather and is no longer threatened. That's good, I suppose. They search all of Nola's prior residences for Candace, but they've taken to the county roads. So Frank sits at home hoping someone else will do the finding for him and just call to let him know. He does receive a gentleman caller in the form of Michael, now hungry and despondent. He nonchalantly mentions for the first time the disturbed kids Raglan keeps in the work shed for Nola to care for. Upon hearing this, Frank leaves the damaged man with full reign of the house as he rushes to the facility. When he arrives, things are dark and quiet. He ventures deep into the woods until he reaches the cabin. He confronts Raglan, who tries to play it coy until it's revealed that Ruth Mayer is dead and Candace has been kidnapped. If that's true, she'll be up with the others, but there's a buttload of them and they'll kill anyone who tries to retrieve her. He then reveals that Nola is not their surrogate, she's their actual mother, and they, the children of her rage, were conceived and motivated by her anger. The only real chance they have is for Frank to smooth things over with Nola to keep the brood docile, so Raglan can saunter in and remove candy. Frank doesn't fully trust him, but really has no choice here, so he goes in and finds that she's actually excited to see him. He tries to hit her with the sweet nothings, but she's having a hard time buying it. He tells her that he's enthusiastic about them rebuilding their family, but she's concerned that what she has going on now is just too strange to be accepted by polite society. Show me, educate me, involve me. And she's not totally sure about this, wanting him to fully commit to this bite of the apple, which he freely accepts. Since he asked, she shows, revealing to him the unassailable beauty of the natural world. Meanwhile, Hal has entered the shed and taken the temp of the room. Deeming the water to be fine, he wades in and searches the bunks. As the broodlings look on, he eventually finds Candace and gently wakes her back into her living nightmare. There is nothing more beautiful than a woman's love for her parthenogenetically conceived 
perceived rage babies, but the sight of her freeing the child from its birth sac is hard to take in. And when she starts cleaning it, forget about it. Frank's inability to maintain a stone face allows her to catch on to his revulsion. Her recognition of this causes the children to get riled up so fast you can hear Raglan's butthole slam shut. When she releases her rage, the brood is activated. Raglan blasts a few of them, but they outnumber him by a significant margin. And once they get their little hands and beaks all over him, it's over. They can hear the commotion upstairs and Frank attempts to encourage Nola to take a chill pill. But she then freely admits that, at this point, she would rather kill Candace than let him take her away. With Nola unwilling to make them stop, Frank does it for her via slow strangulation that is egged on by Nola. And when the light finally goes out, the commotion dies down. Frank finds bodies strewn about and Hal lightly mauled. He finds Candace and comforts her with the warmth of a father's love. All the way up and through the woods, where they emerge, finally free to live the lives they want with the cycle of anger and violence fully extinguished. Forever never to return again. Well, that was brutal, but if you're looking to go deeper than that, be sure to check out this video next. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.